that's where they were. Good evening, everyone. I guess we're already on TV, so I'm going to just start in. So our format tonight is going to be, um, well, I'm going to back up. I'll give you a little bit of history. One, one of the, I'm the chairman, I'm Frank Sprague. I'm the chair of the Claremont School Board. And as in that capacity, we've been having joint meetings with the Claremont City Council. And from that has come um, some common themes that we have in New Hampshire, in, in uh, Claremont, but also in other parts of New Hampshire. So it was, we decided as a joint board that we would be inviting gubernatorial candidates in. Um, school board member Ben Ware and I, uh, Jason Ben Ware, ran into Steve Marchand. We had gone, he had, was out at the senior center and we attended that and I asked him, I said, would you be interested in coming back and to another uh, meeting with the public city council and um, school board? And he said, sure. And um, so here he is. We've extended invitations to Molly Kelly, trying to work those details. We've extended a, an invitation to Governor Sununu and haven't heard anything. So um, we're going with what we have. We have uh, Steve Marchand here tonight, and we're glad to have him. And um, the format tonight will be there are uh, Councilor Kears here from the City Council, Jason Benware, and myself from the school board. We've got some questions that we, we will ask first and then open it up for public uh, questions. So ours will be fairly quick, and then we'll get into the public piece of it, and then we'll be, be wrapping it up. But at this time, I'd like to invite Steve Marchand, gubernatorial candidate, to the podium. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. You take the water whenever you can get it. Yeah. Thanks for uh, being here this evening. Thanks for thinking of us gubernatorial candidates. Uh, sometimes you feel like you're in the wilderness, you know? It's a small state, and then you get in your car, and then you realize it's not so small. I'll put this back down here. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll just I'll make a couple of quick introductory remarks, and then uh, get to Q&A as fast as possible, because uh, that's why you're here. Uh, so I don't know, some of you might know a little bit about my background. Uh, I live in Portsmouth, uh, born and bred in Manchester. Uh, my, uh, my folks came down from Quebec in the 1960s, like a lot of folks in New Hampshire, and uh, was born and raised in a French-speaking household on the west side of town. I eventually went to Goffstown High School, and then uh, it was cheaper for me to go to college outside of New Hampshire than it was to go inside of New Hampshire, which is uh, probably not unique in that respect. I uh, ended up going to Syracuse University, and eventually got a master's in public administration. So a lot of what I've been doing off and on over the last 20 years is audits of local, county, and state governments. So folks that know me from my uh, time uh, in public life, uh, in the middle there, I was a city councilor and mayor of Portsmouth, and then more recently was the director of corporate relations for the University of New Hampshire. Uh, and uh, like I said, I've been living in Portsmouth now for about 17 years, uh, married. Uh, Sandy is an unbelievably patient person in the midst of what we're doing uh, these days. And I got two daughters, Abby and Maggie. Abby will be 15 next week. Uh, Maggie turned 13 about a month and a half ago. Uh, that's a very exciting household right there. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, some of you may understand that. So I'm a numbers guy. And it means that uh, for a lot, relative to most candidates you'll run into running for governor, I think a lot about detail. And I love local government. Uh, that's my background. It's what I've been paid to study, uh, the best and the worst in the country of local, county, and state governments. And, uh, and we haven't had an ex-mayor as a governor since Judd Gregg's father, Hugh Gregg. He was the mayor of Nashua for a term, uh, and a great man. He did uh, an amazing number of things, including his uh, military service, and he's seen as sort of the, uh, the protector of the first in the nation primary uh, about as much as anybody. But it's been a long time. And I think you can tell, uh, because if you knew what it was like to be on the receiving end of the you-know-what rolling down the hill from state government, uh, you might be more sensitive to the impact of decisions at the state level on everything from local property taxes to the fairness or lack thereof in the way that we fund education, which I suspect may be a significant part of what we talk about here in Claremont, uh, and uh, public infrastructure and social services. I will go and lean into it like this. There is no state in America that relies more on property taxes 
to pay for education, infrastructure, and social services in the state of New Hampshire. It means that we are a 19th century structure of governance. In my auditing work, when I talk to friends of mine who've been doing it as long as I've been alive, and I tell them that I'm from New Hampshire, they will laugh. And they will say, that's funny. When we want to know what 19th century governance in America looked like, we come to New Hampshire today. The consequences of this are probably wider than you even know. And I think here in Claremont, you know them better than most. Uh, it means, for example, that at the same time that we've had 25% drop in our K through 12 population in just the last 15 years, we have added 10% more school administrative units in the same period of time. And that means that we now have the second highest administrative cost per pupil of any state in America, and it's going up. And that means in a large percentage of the towns and cities in New Hampshire, you have a smaller and smaller number of taxpayers that are paying for an increasingly inefficient delivery system for local and regional governance. You're paying more money, and yet you're not feeling the results. And it's not because superintendents are suddenly making a lot more money than they used to make, or because there's somehow more fraud or waste or abuse. It's not that. It's math. And math is a nonpartisan exercise. Uh, we simply lack scale in the way we raise the money, in the way we deliver services, in the way we spend the money, at a, in a way that is unique among the states in this country. And so as governor, uh, my job is to make this the best state in America to start and raise your family and to start and grow a business. I need us to get younger quickly, and I need us to become more entrepreneurial quickly. We've collapsed as a state in terms of the structure of our business uh, community in entrepreneurship. Most jobs in this country are uh, created by new businesses. We love our existing businesses, but it is new businesses, the dynamism of an economy, that creates jobs. Uh, we are also the second highest median age of any state in America. We have the lowest birth rate of any state in America. We've dropped as a percentage in high school population more than any state in America in the last 10 years. The business community knows this better than the politicians do. And it freaks them out because they think of it like this. If I start a business or I move my business in, one of two things is going to happen. If I have a lousy idea or I hit a, a bad patch in the economy, it will fail on the weight of the poor idea. But if I have a good idea and it succeeds and I need to grow, I am not in a position to be able to enjoy the, the fruits of my risk taking. It is hard to start a business. It is risky. It is amazing. It is uniquely American, the idea of an economy built on entrepreneurship. But if you don't have talent in a community that could take the jobs if you are in a position where you need to expand, well, then you're taking all the risk. But you're not in a position to easily enjoy the benefit when your risk taking pays off. This is how the business community thinks. And from my time as the director of corporate relations at UNH, I was there several years, I listened to hundreds of businesses, the CEOs, the, the heads of HR, the heads of engineering. A lot of them are self-described conservatives, some are liberal, many are fairly apolitical. They just want to do their job and have their business be successful, make money, pay their employees, go home at night. But they would say the same thing. They didn't ask for a cut in the business profits tax. They didn't ask for right to work. They didn't ask for a low minimum wage. What they asked for is people, for the reasons I just said a moment ago. And so I would ask them, what are the characteristics that keep people in a community if you got them and brings them into a community if you don't? And it, what they said compared closely to what I have experienced off and on over 20 years auditing communities around the country. Uh, being a successful mayor, and being a born and bred New Hampshireite. From Manch, I got an aunt who's a retired dairy farmer in Pittsburgh, and I've lived in Portsmouth for 20 years. I'm about as New Hampshire as you're going to get. This is what they said. Number one, we need America's best pre-K through 12 public education. If you have amazing public schools in your community, you will consistently win tiebreakers for talent. And if you don't, you can spend all the money you want trying to do it other ways. And it will be less efficient, less effective, and a heck of a lot more frustrating than if you got the education part right in the first place. Number two was infrastructure. Uh, it's bridges. It's roads. It's reliable drinking water. It's affordable electricity. 
that is sustainable and can be locally produced whenever possible. And we can get into energy policy in a minute. Uh, the third element is dealing with mental health and addiction in a long-term, healthcare-based, sustainable, really lifelong kind of way. I have seen over a year and a half of campaigning that mental health may be moving up the fastest in terms of the prioritization in the communication I get in meet and greets of any issue, certainly among the top. I've experienced it firsthand. I have a loved one in my family who, uh, while I've been a candidate in this race, uh, has suffered greatly from mental illness. It was something I did not anticipate when I started. It has put incredible additional uh, stress uh, during a pretty stressful exercise uh, to begin with. And she's doing better. Uh, but now I have traversed the mental health system as a family member. Uh, the work being done is amazing. The other thing that's amazing is that some of the folks doing it are willing to stay uh, with the workload they are given and the pay that they are not. Uh, the biggest fear my wife and I have at a time when there's a lot of instability because of what I'm doing right now is that the counselors or pediatric psychiatrists that we use on a regular basis for our family will leave. Uh, it's taken a long time to build a degree of trust and comfort in our family uh, that helps, uh, helps us with a difficult situation involving mental illness. Um, but I know roughly how much they make because my wife has been on the board of Seacoast Mental Health for a long time because of mental health issues uh, with involving her family. Uh, so we're familiar with it. They're not, they're not doing this for the money. They can make more money tomorrow going somewhere else. And we have a dramatic shortage in mental health professionals. We have a dramatic shortage in the halfway houses needed, the transitional housing needed, once people get out of a crisis uh, center. But they cannot simply go back to regular life. Uh, there is no such thing as going back to normal. You, there is a new normal. And it requires different levels of assistance and housing uh, in order to make that happen. We lack that in New Hampshire to such an extent uh, that we were sued and we lost the lawsuit. And now we are moving deck chairs around, if we're being honest about it, uh, to deal with it. And so we're not dealing with it. The same thing applies in terms of addiction and long-term recovery. Uh, our reliance in recovery centers around the state on philanthropy and short-term grants to pay for recurring operating expenses is just poor, it's poor government. It's poor management. The uh, uh, leaders I've seen in the uh, recovery community tell me regularly they have a good idea what needs to be done. We're learning very quickly about best practices around the country. But if you don't know how you're getting paid next year because of the nature of the revenue streams, it is hire, hard to hire mental health professionals. It is difficult to bring in talent that you're paying less than they could make anywhere else anyway. And then they have to go home and tell their spouse, I'm taking a job making less. And here's the kicker. Uh, they couldn't guarantee me in 180 days uh, what the revenue stream will be to make sure I continue being paid. Uh, that is, if there's ever a state responsibility, it strikes me that helping provide those reliable operating funds, uh, both for mental health and for addiction and long-term recovery, that's in the bullseye of what part of our job is. So it's education, it's infrastructure, it's addiction and mental health services, and it's building a culture of entrepreneurship. Uh, so I would ask them, what does that culture look like? And I'm a lifelong Democrat. Some of you may be as well. Uh, even self-described conservatives, by the end of their description of what the culture of entrepreneurship looks like, sound like downright liberal Democrats. They say they want paid family and medical leave because we force women in their late 20s and early 30s to, in effect, make a decision that affects the rest of their life, their professional life versus family life. Just because we got the lowest birth rate in America doesn't mean that we should pretend in our public policy that women don't get pregnant anymore. But that's what we do with paid family and medical leave. And I've got a specific plan to sustainably uh, pay for that. It means being pro-immigrant. I am the son of immigrants, as I mentioned in the outset. Immigrants are amazing. And we should not let uh, isolated anecdotes of the worst case scenarios, which could have easily applied for those native born in this country as they do for those who were not, to determine how we do public policy. I do data for a living. The plural of anecdote is not data. We need to use the big numbers. Uh, and uh, the most entrepreneurial people in our society are immigrants. And the youngest people are immigrants. So if we're trying to get younger and we're trying to get more entrepreneurial, 
Understanding the positive power of immigration is a pretty good place to start. It is one of the ultimate pro-entrepreneur policies. Another pro-entrepreneur policy, pro-growth, universal health care. The number one reason people don't leave a business to start a business in this country is because of an employer-based model of health insurance. We developed that system in the uh, 1940s during World War II. FDR put a wage freeze on, and the way that businesses dealt with it was to say, I can't pay you more, but I'll tell you what I can do. I can give you lots of health insurance, and why not? It's cheap, life expectancy 63, and nobody changes jobs anyway. 76 years later, we pretty much use the same employer-based system to deliver health care for uh, half of Americans, and yet none of those three facts that drove that original structure are true anymore. They're simply not true and they end up impeding the free flow of talent and capital to the places where it would do the most good. I just sounded like Milton Friedman, because that's what he said, the ultimate free market conservative. And he said it is the impeding of free flow of capital and talent that will do the most to destroy capitalism. And the number one thing that destroys that in our current economy is an employer-based model of health care. On so many issues, pro I'm the only candidate talking about pre-K. We're one of six states in America that do not provide any state funding for pre-K. How do you expect to communicate to younger people that we seek to keep here or to move into this state when we are the only state east of South Dakota that does not fund a nickel of pre-K education when we know how strong the benefits are of it? That's a progressive policy, I suppose. So is my proposal for debt-free higher education. My parents I mentioned earlier my dad was a carpenter, and in 1990, he got stuck with a house that he could not sell. That was a nasty recession if you lived in New Hampshire at that time. No mortgages available. Uh, my dad couldn't sell the house, and now we had two mortgages in effect and no income. So we cut, among other expenses, our health insurance. And three months after we did, my mom, at 39 years old, had a heart attack. That was an $80,000 medical bill. They harassed us several times a day, saying that if you're not a deadbeat, you'll pay the bill as if we had the $80,000, we just didn't want to buy health insurance. <clears throat> uh, we ended up filing bankruptcy. It's the number one reason people file personal bankruptcy in this country. Uh, my dad, who is the hardest working person I've met, I may be the hardest working person in politics in New Hampshire. I've done over 300 meet and greet events, thousands of conversations, been doing this for a year and a half. It's why we're going to win the primary in a few weeks and a general in November. But I am not the hardest working person I know. That's Norm Marchand. That's my dad. But for the last 27 years, he has been unable to go back to doing the thing he loves doing most, being self-employed. And the reason is because of the pre-existing condition that my mom presented after the heart attack. At that time, I was trying to be the first person to graduate high school and go to college in my family. And so I didn't know anything about how to do it. So I applied to three colleges. And two of them came in real quick. UNH came in first. I said, that's great. I'd be thrilled to go to UNH. They said, good news, you're in. Bad news, you're paying the sticker price. Well, it's the highest in-state tuition in America now. It was the highest in-state tuition in 1991 as well. And it was 13000 a year. Sounds like a deal now, but it wasn't then. Uh, my problem was $12,000 ago. The idea among my fellow Democrats that the definition of progressive success of success among Democrats, of success among anybody, is to freeze tuition at the highest in-state level of any state in America, and we call that a win, is to accept goalposts that have been shifted to the right for 45 years. And when we begin the debate here, then our best case scenario does not represent where the mainstream of thought in our state or public policy or best practices in America are. So I have a debt-free college plan. And it says that we turn most four-year degree programs into five. We turn them into co-ops like Northeastern University. You go work for participating companies in those co-ops. If they, and what happens as part of it, we have a new state grant that pays for half of your tuition, and the private sector pays for the other half. Because when I was in corporate relations, they would tell me they would regularly lose seventy-five dollars to $100,000 of lost productivity, opportunity cost, bonuses, moving cost, because of the lack of workforce. They would rather pay money to develop a relationship with even a middle school or high school student to get them to go to school in state afterwards. And if they stayed, did at least one of their two co-ops with the participating employers, 
And then you stay after graduation for three or more years with a New Hampshire-based company that was part of the match program. You got no debt. You go to California, I can't stop you. But then you're on the hook for the money. It is a powerful carrot at a time when we need to keep as many young people in the state as possible. It is remarkably affordable. Year one of my plan, it is $4 million. The state budget is $6 billion a year. If you have an auditor as your governor who is a good mayor and has looked at the best and worst of practices around the country, what you'll find is two things, and they're not mutually exclusive. If you want things, you do have to pay for them. Math is not partisan. But if you know how to pay for them, you can do it in a sustainable way that makes us a competitive tax structure, that makes us fair in the way we raise and spend money, and will make us the best state in America to start and raise your family and to start and grow a business. These are the stakes. And I think that the last time the country was this messy politically was when I was very young. Watergate. The, regardless of your party affiliation, that was the last time the country, the two political parties, the level of anxiety was as it is in our political world right now. And what happened in that time was that one of the two parties eventually defined the future. They won the debate. They won the argument. They built a new and durable coalition that was political, but was durable and could last for, it turned out, 40 years. It was the Republican Party. It was the conservative movement. And the head of it ended up being Ronald Reagan. It was the NRA. It was the John Birch Society. It was a lot going on, but it culminated with the election of Ronald Reagan. Six years after Watergate, he won 44 states. Ten years after Watergate, he won 49 states. In 1974, you would have lost any bet you placed that the Republican Party would have become the dominant party of the, most of the next 40 years of American politics. But the reason why is that then Governor Reagan and others define the future. Now, I'm a Democrat. I, wasn't, I would not be thrilled with a lot of that definition. Your miles may vary. But that does not change that there was a moment of transformation. This is the next moment of transformation. One of the two parties in the next two to six years will define the future of our party, of our state, and of our country. So for me, obviously, I'm trying to defeat Chris Sununu and replace him. It is not personal. I know Chris personally. I'm not here because I think he's a bad guy. I just don't think he's a very good governor at a time when there's tremendous opportunity and risk if we do not act in a thoughtful but decisive way. But that's not the only reason I'm running. I'm running because I want to be a part of defining the future of my party, of our state, and in our own small way of the country. And I think I've got the vision to know where to go, the competence to know how to get there, the courage to say it out loud with boundless energy and the optimism that can only come from an immigrant's kid. If you have that combination, you don't just win the election. You get to define the future in a way that I think will make for a very exciting generation to come and will uh, equalize in a positive way opportunity and I believe positive outcomes in the long run regardless of the community in which you live in New Hampshire. So I'm looking forward to taking questions, and uh, hopefully you'll know where I'm at on any issue you wish by the time I get back in the car tonight. Thank you very much. We have some questions that we've compiled from city uh, city councilors and school board members. I forgot to announce, uh, introduce Councilor Keir. As I said, I'm Frank Sprague. I'm the board chair. Just uh, Jason Benware um, on the Claremont School Board. So we've got a number of questions that we'd like to go through first. And that um, I have some from um, Mayor Lovett sent me a, a sheet full. So, so actually only eight, but uh, questions. So Mayor Lovett, yes. So. I think I will start and um, with number one. Claremont has the highest tax rate in the state. As is the case to most communities, the largest portion of the rate goes toward education. This community understands the value of a good education and need for a successful school district to spur economic growth. As you had said, that people look for the, for the schools when they want to come here. We have demonstrated that by investing in our school facilities, recently completing a $12 million renovation of our high school without any state aid from, this, uh, from the state. We have transitioned to higher efficiency heating systems, reduced energy costs. We have invested in technology and security. At the same time, the state is reducing its financial contributions every year 
uh, specifically through adequacy aid. The community does not have the resources to finance education at the local level. The New Hampshire S Supreme Court has ruled that the state has an obligation to support education. How would you address this if elected? This, it's funny, if you ask people today, 2018, what the number one issue facing New Hampshire is, the majority of New Hampshireites will say it is addiction. And I am not suggesting that is not incredibly important. I hope that came across in my remarks a few minutes ago. But I will tell you what the biggest issue will be in that poll in the next two to four years, this one. We are going to get sued again. We are going to lose the lawsuit again. I am not an attorney, but I don't think you have to be an attorney. You just have to be reasonably good at math. You have to be reasonably uh, fluent on history, recent history in New Hampshire. The gap between the have and have not communities in terms of property value per pupil, in terms of spending per pupil, is wider now than it was before the first Claremont lawsuit, which was wide enough to lose the lawsuit. The Constitution says adequacy, adequate, adequate. Right now, we provide an average of $4,400 a kid, which is barely 30% of the average cost per pupil in New Hampshire. If I said, I say this in a lot of places, if I said, uh, let's cut 70% of your school's budget, and you tell me that you could get at least an adequate education with the 30% that remains, and everybody laughs, because nobody believes that. So this is where we're going. And so, uh, you know, I said the courage to say it out loud, I will say it. We need more money. In every state in the country, Wyoming, Mississippi, pick the reddest state you want. They look at the way we do this, and they go, that is unbelievably inefficient and unfair. It's, that's not a partisan statement. The most conservative lawmaker in the reddest states regularly votes for higher levels of state support for education than the most liberal lawmakers in New Hampshire. But because we don't compare ourselves to the best practices of the country, we compare ourselves to Mel Thompson's New Hampshire in 1974. We compare ourselves to New Hampshire last year. That's what we do. So I've not taken the pledge. Because the pledge is for the party of the past. And I want to be part of the party of the future. It doesn't mean that we're going to go wild with spending. But it means I recognize the nature of the challenge that we're in. And it means we need additional revenue. So on the near, the near term, there are at least three things I got to do. Number one is I need additional revenue. Uh, it starts with reversing the business profits tax cut. That's 100 million bucks a year. The businesses didn't ask for it. I know that as well as anybody in New Hampshire because my job for several years was to talk to the very people who would have the opinion about it. They didn't ask for that. They asked for people. Number two is I would raise the gas tax by four cents a gallon. That's about $30 million of additional revenue a year. The gas, uh, the, uh, the driver pays for less than half of an uh, increase on a gas tax on average. Probably about a penny and a half of it will end up being felt per gallon by the consumer. The majority of it is absorbed at other places in the, in the, um, uh, in the profit-making element. Uh, we have 352 red list bridges set to join the list in the next 10 years without any revenue attached for dealing with them. I opposed a, a toll increase when asked last December. Not because the tolls couldn't use some help, but because I can, by law, only use toll increases on toll roads. And I have done so much traveling. I've driven almost 4,000 miles in the last three weeks in New Hampshire. I have experienced your roads and everybody else's roads. And the gas tax increase is a much broader base from which to raise the revenue. And it gives me the flexibility to deal with uh, infrastructure uh, priorities that are outside of, frankly, Hillsborough County, Rockingham County, and parts of Stratford County. If, you, if you're not thoughtful about the ways you raise the money, you can handcuff yourself into most of the investments in infrastructure going to a relatively small percentage of the area. And I'm thinking about Grafton, and I'm thinking about Sullivan, and Cheshire, and Coos, and parts of uh, uh, Belknap typically being on the short end of that stick if you don't think of it the way I'm describing. A third thing is I've been a longtime advocate, continue to be, for the legalization, regulation, taxation of cannabis. We will literally be surrounded by legalization by the end of this year, including Canada. Two years ago when I proposed this, uh, some folks thought I was some wild-eyed liberal or something for it. 70% of New Hampshireites uh, support it. A majority of Republicans, Democrats, and undeclareds. We are surrounded by it by the end of the year. It is now even in the Democratic platform this year. 
It is good to skate to where the puck is going, not to where the puck has been. And on this and a number of other issues, if you simply say them out loud and you're willing to lead, you are in the mainstream. It's just the mainstream is looking for leadership to point and say, we're going right over there. I'll make the case and win the argument. So the first thing is we need more revenue. And the second thing is we're going to need to incentivize school districts, uh, public safety departments, public works departments to collaborate and consolidate administrative functions. It is, when I audit communities, I often, I was in Florida last year, uh, Polk County. It's in between Tampa and Orlando. Are we, I think we're talking there. Okay, there you go. It's growing like crazy. So I go and I'm in Bartow, Florida. That's the name of the city. All right, all right. So I sit and I start the interview, and I'm a nice guy, but you know I'm there to audit. So you're not you're not loving what's about to happen when I'm sitting down with you. And I go, hey, no, I'm not going to bite. Quick, uh, quick question: Where are you from? They never say I'm from Bartow. They say I'm from Polk County. When I did work in Pasco County, Florida, they say I'm from Pasco County. In the West and the Southeast, much of government is thought of at a regional level. Because 130 years ago, they figured out that was a lot cheaper. You got better results at a better price point. New Hampshire is 234 communities that happen to get drawn around one border, and then we wonder why your property taxes are out of control and your outcomes are not what you wish they were. If you had an auditor who used to be a mayor who was kind of looking at this, it's amazing how many hundreds of millions of dollars over a decade in, in, in savings that uh, directly are felt in property taxes and improved outcomes you would have, including in education. So we need to put powerful incentives in the budget to not mandate, but to encourage such collaboration. And then the third thing, and I know we talked about this some when I saw you a month or two ago, was to introduce a concept that is not unusual in much of the country, but is in New Hampshire. In local government, you don't have a lot of options for how to raise the revenue that you're on the hook for. Pretty much you got one, property tax. But what happens to a 47-year-old who loses their job? What happens to somebody who retires? There are a couple of elements, but not, it's, it's pretty clunky. What do we do for people whose income dramatically changes, even as their property value does not? The answer is we tell them to sell their house and move. I cannot tell you how foreign that concept is in much of the country, because in much of the country, they have an income element to help you determine the tax liability you have at the local level. You lose your job, you have less ability to pay than if you don't lose your job. If you retire, there's a pretty good chance that your ability to pay goes down than before you retired. And communities that are offered that tool in the toolbox to use income, and there's a number of ways to do it, to uh, better reflect what I hope is a diminishing amount of liability you have at the local level, but a fairer way to pay for it. These three things in combination, the collaboration consolidation, additional state revenue, and giving you tools to more fairly pay for the reduced liability you have, we're going to have to do all of them. I've got to spin all three plates at the same time, more or less. Uh, but that's how we're going to, you know, I'd love us to be 21st century government. I would definitely settle for 20th century. That's how much room we got to improve. Uh, and these are ways that we can do that. So if you get in, what chances there there's going to be an income tax? It, can you do it in New Hampshire? Or? Well, I mean, uh, what I'm proposing is the, what basically a, is, a, they call it a circuit breaker or the local option that allows you to, to use income in a, in a variety of ways. This I'd have to work through with the legislature. There's a half dozen ways you could do it. That would give local governments the ability to use income as a, a, a factor or a dominant factor in determining your liability as compared to, uh, say, a state income tax or a state sales tax, which I'm not proposing. Uh, I, uh, when I talk to a lot of Republicans uh, in local government, uh, they are sick and tired of going back to their constituents and uh, having to explain how what we do right now is fiscal responsibility. Uh, they, and, and, and part of it is a lot of folks in Planet Concord, all right, who have not spent a lot of time in local government, much less audited governments, they see high property taxes and they go, hey, we balanced the state budget. We did our job. But what they actually did is they downshifted cost powerfully to the local level, and then they don't give you any tools to deal with it. They reduce, they, they send it down without a check attached to the responsibility, and then they say, it's not our problem, we balance the budget. If you just had better leadership at the local level, your problem would go away. My experience from being around the state for a long time, having a lot of conversations, 
is that most local elected officials actually know what they'd like to do. They are simply not in a position to be able to do it. You literally do not have the bonding capacity to be able to make the public investments that would attract private investment. But people at the local level generally, they know what to do. But state government here in New Hampshire, more than any state in America, basically says, you're on your own. And if you're Bedford or you're Windham or you're Portsmouth, it's going to work out all right. But if you're m the majority of other communities in the state, you are over a barrel. And it's getting worse, which is why we're going to get sued, which is why we're going to lose a lawsuit. Great. So last year, the bill to reinstate a state contribution to the New Hampshire retirement system narrowly failed. Its passage would have provided some relief to the municipalities across the state who are now providing 100% of the employer's contribution. Do you believe the state should provide a percentage of the employer's contribution? Why or why not? Uh, yeah. And my Democratic opponent actually was the one who voted to knock it down from 35% to zero overnight. I wasn't mayor when it happened, but it happened. My assistant mayor succeeded me as mayor. I didn't run again. And uh, so I talked to him very regularly. And um, the suddenness with which that uh, contribution went from 35 to nothing uh, was unlike mo most usually if somebody's going to do something that which I disagreed with the decision in the first place. But if you're going to do it, at least you usually give a ramp down to give local government an opportunity to deal with it. They did not do that. Uh, and I find it curious that my Democratic opponent bemoans the downshifting of costs to the local level after voting to downshift costs to the local level. Bless you. Uh, so we need to get that back up. And I understand it will be a multi-year process. I think Renny Cushing out in Hampton was one of the sponsors of it. I think it would have gone, was it 10%, 15%? I forget the number. 15. Um, but to move us back towards that direction. But again, this, it, it is a microcosm of what we see state government doing over the course of my lifetime. We used to have a 90% wastewater treatment plant reimbursement fund. 90%. We got rid of it in 1984. Promise it'll be back in two years. It's never come back. That's one of the most expensive investments you will make. And the, the foolishness of it, of, of ending it, is that it used to have a reimbursement rate that would go up if you collaborated with other communities when you put together your wastewater treatment plant. So now Portsmouth, right, one of the best property tax bases in the state, so no crying for Portsmouth, but if it's hard for us is what I'm getting at, it's hard for everybody. Uh, a few years ago, after trying to avoid it and doing upgrades and everything, we finally bonded over $100 million for our wastewater treatment plant about four years ago. Uh, but it's just for Portsmouth. Six days later, Exeter bonded about $55 million to build a new wastewater treatment plant. In any other part of the country, what would have happened is Portsmouth and Newington and Greenland and Stratum and Exeter and other communities would have come together with powerful carrots to do so, and you would have actually, you could have built the entire region's wastewater treatment plant for about the cost of Exeter and Portsmouth alone. It would have been better for the environment, it would have been way cheaper, but now all the taxpayers of those two communities will be paying for it for, you know, 15, 20 years. Uh, it goes back to the way we think about it right now. And, uh, but all of this is we downshift the cost. We take, uh, um, uh, we take school building aid and we freeze it. We uh, take the retirement cost and we downshift it. We take the moose plate, L-chip money, right? People think you're getting your moose plate for L-chip projects. Whenever we feel like it, we take that money out, we throw it in the general fund. Then when people find out about it in the paper, they take a corroded amount of confidence in the public sector, and it gets corroded just a little bit more because they feel like they've been lied to because they paid extra money for something that they personally believed in but was optional. And then after they did it, they go, you didn't even use it for the reason. Why should I do the moose plate anymore? So that when you try to reinstate the program, there is less uh, interest in it because you just kicked him in the kneecaps a couple of years earlier. Th this is a systems approach. You have to change the, the culture or else it gets worse. And especially communities like Claremont will be disproportionately impacted if we don't reverse it. Okay. As an immediate measure, would you support a moratorium on cuts to stabilization aid? Would you support restoring the amount that has been cut since 2015? I'd have to look at the math of it to tell you definitively yes to either or both of those. The way I'm thinking of it uh, for now is uh, 
if we go where I think we need to go, the question to some extent will be moot because the overall spending per pupil provided by the state, state support, is going to have to go to a significantly higher level than it is right now. Legally, I think it's going to have to go to a, I mean, I don't, I'm, I, get, I don't know what adequate is, but it's not 30%. So I don't know what the, I, I, I cannot sit here tonight and tell you definitively what I think that number will end up being. But I believe it will have to be at a number that will render the current way that we do it, including the, the question, which is a good question, but I'm, I think most politicians would be focused on like, like just this two-year cycle, and then in two years we'll deal with the next two-year cycle, and that's how you kind of end up not making the systems approach change that you need. Um, but I think the number is going to end up being a higher amount of state support per pupil than either of those, uh, an affirmative answer to either of those questions would provide. So the, the next question, you've, you've answered, I think, part of it in your overall spiel, but I'm going to ask it the way it's written. Okay. Uh, what do you see as being the top three priorities for the state in the next two years, and how would you address them? And I heard education, I heard mental well, health education, already. funding, the way we do it, it, if that's not right up there, then we're ignoring the elephant. Uh, I think the way that we deal with mental health and uh, long-term recovery services has to be right up there as well. Um, I mentioned infrastructure as well. Uh, I think that for uh, the way we communicate to the private sector a seriousness of purpose in making generational investments in New Hampshire, we need to be serious about uh, generational public investments. That's also getting indirectly at the challenges of local government, where if we tell local government that you're on your own for a lot of your infrastructure investments, uh, and then when they don't have the bonding capacity to do it at the level necessary, Private sector entities say, I'm not terribly interested. I mean, I've learned this, uh, one of the mantras I've learned over 20 years, smart public investment breeds private investment. It's not the other way around. Um, it's the University of California uh, higher education system that was a driving force of Silicon Valley being developed. Not the other way around. It wasn't Silicon Valley and then higher ed decided California was a good place or something. I mean, there are many examples of that. The, uh, the research triangle in North Carolina the triangle is wrapped around UNC, NC State, Duke. I mean, they, you know, there's, a, there's an education element that's hard to avoid, and a lot of it has a public um, uh, investment element to it. One other thing that I, I want to achieve in year one to kind of rebuild confidence in government in a, in a genuine way is there's a, a three-part package uh, of how we improve governance. So number one uh, is I would repeal a pair of bills signed by Governor Sununu that have the effect of suppressing uh, voter turnout and voter registration. Uh, HB 1264 this year, SB 3 last year. I never thought the overparticipation of young people in civic life was a problem. I didn't think that we had too much of it going on and we needed to make it a little bit tougher. Uh, I would repeal both of them and I'm a fan of automatic voter registration. I don't get why this is hard. That's number one. Number two is an independent redistricting commission. Uh, right now, New Hampshire, and a lot of other states, but New Hampshire, we basically allow politicians to pick their constituents. I always thought it should be constituents picking the politicians. So Iowa has the best independent redistricting commission in the country. It's a red state. This is not a partisan thing. But they have many of the most competitive congressional districts in the country. It's not a coincidence. They have a nonpartisan, independent, totally transparent, algorithm-driven, independent redistricting commission. We should mimic that. And the third thing is, I'm the uh, first uh, candidate for governor in at least a generation to propose what I believe is the only way to deal with a campaign finance system that is completely broken, and that's the public funding of elections. Uh, I've got a specific plan that's between uh, 4.2 and 6.3 million bucks a year. That's less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the operating cost of New Hampshire's budget a year. But it would dramatically improve the way we select the people that spend the other 99.93% of the operating budget in New Hampshire. It basically says that if you raise 90% or more of your money from in-state contributions of $100 or less, and you meet certain thresholds for overall fundraising, you get a basically a two-for-one public match for it. In exchange, you agree to that cap. No corporate, no PAC, uh, obviously almost entirely in-state money by definition, and now you're raising your money at $100 increments. Other states do it. I actually went to Connecticut at the beginning of this year and talked to the people that created their program. It's an excellent program. I asked them how they would improve it if they were starting over. 
It's hard to change it once you start it, because people build around a system. <laughs> but we have the chance to learn from them. And the plan I've got, which is at stevebarshan.com, is painfully specific. And it turns out it's not just people that voted for Bernie or Hillary that really like it. It's a lot of Republicans, because they recognize that right now, people are chasing the money. So when I proposed this, uh, Governor Sununu uh, gave a predictable but polite answer. He said, oh, that's a liberal policy. All right, Chris and I, you know, we're civil. My Democratic opponent, Democratic opponent, said that's awful. Taxpayers shouldn't pay for politicians' campaigns. That's what she said. So who the hell do you think is paying for those campaigns right now? Right? Uh, if we as Democrats accept the goalposts on campaign finance reform, where we can't even uh, quietly support the concept of public funding of elections, then we have accepted those goalposts that have shifted to the right for 40 years that I was talking about at the outset. And this is true on so many issues, and I think the next generation of leadership, particularly the Democratic Party, needs to be direct, thoughtful, but be direct about these issues. The, the, uh, the mainstream is with us on these issues, if we will only say it out loud in a thoughtful, sophisticated, authentic, and direct way. And I think campaign finance reform is a big time mainstream issue. So that's a package of reforms that I think can be done in the first year, and that'd probably be one of the three priorities. All right, so Claremont has the only Amtrak stop on the western side of the state. The, the Vermonter line directly connects us to major cities along the eastern seaboard, including New York City, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and DC. There are also efforts at the federal level to extend the line directly to Montreal. What role do you see passenger rail playing in our state, and would you support expansion and how? I do. I, I uh, support uh, rail expansion both here as well as uh, in the uh, southern tier, which often dominates the debate on it, the conversation on it, uh, going up through Nashua and, uh, and I would presume Manchester as well. Uh, uh, here's why. Um, so we're a small state, and we have really low unemployment. And when Amazon 2 was talking about coming, oh, where we're gonna, they still haven't decided yet. You know, but they were like, hurry up. And, uh, and uh, Governor Sununu said, I want in on that. So he put together a haphazard presentation. He said, New Hampshire is the best place. One of his pitches for why New Hampshire was great is because he said Massachusetts is lousy, uh, that, which is not a compelling argument. Uh, personally, uh, I, I, just two quick things, and this relates to the rail. Number one, I believe that we don't have a choice. I believe Massachusetts is south of us. Like, that, that's not a choice. So you got to deal with it. It's like we chose Massachusetts. Number two, Boston, the 128 belt, is one of the most dynamic economies in the United States. And we're not that far via rail from some of the other most dynamic economies in the, in, in the country, the world. This is ridiculous. So it, this, this is a big, juicy orange, this economy. And to me, rail is a straw that you, you put right in there a small percentage of that that we enjoy in both talent and capital that we get to access more easily. Uh, the benefits are out of control. It increases property values. It increases entrepreneurship. Uh, it increases, and this is the key, if you're going to have rail in your community. So if we want more people to live in Claremont and use rail as a way of accessing the outside world for work, you can, it'll only work if you do two things at the same time. One is the rail. Two is outstanding local education. Because when people are making decisions about where to plop their family, they're making a decision. The number one driver of the decision is the perceived quality of the local school system. If, if, uh, if you got rail in your front door, but you don't think the schools are any good, it, the rail isn't going to matter, at least in terms of families coming here. And the, the true long-term benefit of rail is when it causes new people, talent, typically relatively young by New Hampshire standards, to pick communities where the rail gives them that straw where they can access other parts of the world. And, uh, and so to me, it's, I, I sound like a broken record on it, but if you're going to do all these other things really well, you've got to have the education element. And I say pre-K. I mean pre-K. Again, six states don't offer state funding for it. We're the only one, uh, east of South Dakota, that does it. And if you can do a debt-free higher ed plan, you can get to a point for students and families willing to commit to New Hampshire for a lifetime. We're not just talking uh, um, K through 12. 
That's the moving of the goalposts, right? Right now, success in education is when we say, oh, we got K. As long as you got Kino, you can have full day K. That's success. <laughs> Pre-K through 16, we can do it in a debt-free way and deliver America's best outcomes. You do that and rail, you're cooking now. Uh, if you're in favor of a constitutional amendment on school funding, what would such an amendment say? And how would the legislature be held accountable for supporting our public schools? Uh, I oppose a constitutional amendment because I don't think you can redefine your way out of the problem. Uh, Chris Sununu last year signed a bill that addressed the long list of red list bridges in New Hampshire by redefining the definition of a red list bridge. That shortened the list. Problem solved. Oh wait, unless you drive over the bridge. Redefining something doesn't make it go away. And I think that a constitutional amendment, which would be done, I presume, depending on the language, to have the effect of redefining the state's responsibility for education doesn't do a lick of good for the city of Claremont. It just makes it easier for Planet Concord to go home in June feeling good about themselves. It's like a, it's like a dog that, you know, you, you put the ball up and they can't catch it, and then once in a while you put the ball low enough and then they feel all proud and they go away. That, it, that, if you pass a constitutional amendment, Concord, Planet Concord will be the dog that you lowered the ball enough that they felt like they caught it, but all you did was make it easier for them. That's what Planet Concord is. So I'm against a constitutional amendment. Again, a little bit redundant. Would you keep the current st tax structure, um, meaning property taxes, I think, in New Hampshire, or would you support introducing a sales and or income tax? Why or why not? So I don't support a statewide income tax or statewide sales tax. The sales tax problem is that I find sales tax tends to be regressive in nature. Uh, it tends to hit people on the lower end of the income scale harder than others. And states that say, well, I'll deal with it by exempting certain essential goods in it, this becomes a feeding frenzy for lobbyists who try to make their, their individual product, you know, that, oh, no, that's an essential. Fur coat, that's an essential. It gets cold in the winter. This is what they do. And so it becomes this lobbying Wild West. And I think it's, it's not uh, productive. And I think for border towns in New Hampshire that have built an economy around the lack of a sales tax, uh, that would be a difficult transition for many of them. Um, oh, on the income, on the income tax, uh, two states in the last 40 years or so have introduced an income tax, a statewide income tax, New Jersey and Connecticut. They both did it in the name of lowering property taxes. The three highest property tax states in America are New Hampshire, New Jersey, and Connecticut. It does, so if, if you, you got it, I understand the idea, but I got something I call the Norman Sue test, my parents. My parents, my dad still works, he's 73. He's finishing up a knee replacement surgery recovery in about a week and a half, and he's going back to work, right? Because he's still got a mortgage. He doesn't know how not to work. Um, my dad probably makes 40-something grand a year, probably pays about 12% of it in property tax a year in Goffstown. If we put an income tax in, what will happen within three to five years is my dad will pay $4,200 a year property tax and a modest income tax on top of that. Tell me how this helps Norm Marchand. Uh, and this is simply based on the evidence of states that have tried the same thing. That's why introducing the income element in the local property tax option, as I described, has the effect of kind of capping that conversation, but introducing the fairness element that I think even most conservatives would acknowledge it's a fair way to raise money. But if everybody's paying more money, including Norman Sue Marchand, you know, it may be fair next to your neighbor, but if you're paying more net, uh, in a situation like that, I'm not sure that you're coming out ahead on the deal. So that's why, but the income element is important. It's part of the reason I don't take the pledge because it allows me to introduce the concept of income into the way that local collects their money and I, uh, in a way that I don't think Mel Thompson would appreciate if I took the pledge. Kind of a footnote. I saw a couple, I, uh, I, I, you had your hand up for a while. Was your, okay, all right, yes. If admittedly in the school funding debate, um, one of the net results of Claremont One is that X amount of the school districts that are uh, have-nots uh, were given supplementary funds. In our infinite wisdom, we are now taking those away from the already cash-strapped communities. 
at the rate of 4% a year, $225,000 in real dollars here in Claremont. If I ask nothing else, could we hold our citizens here in Claremont and other like communities harmless until we can get to the larger debate that you're describing? Because it's only going to make it worse about what a dollar raises here between your own community, Portland, I mean, uh, Portsmouth or Moultonboro or Bow, Bedford, you know. No, I, let's, let's stop that foolishness, you know. That was gained through a lawsuit. Oh, well, let me, and it kind of gets to the question you asked maybe 10 minutes ago. Uh, let me be clear. Uh, what I need to do in my first two years in office is I need to increase, in the case of a community like Claremont and many others, I need to increase state funding, not reduce state funding. And so in the course of doing that, I could say with confidence, of course, not reducing your funding by 4% a year would be part of my plan. Uh, because uh, if anything, I need a more progressive formula. I need a more progressive way of looking at how the money is distributed. And this is part of how I'm going to be able to get it through a legislature that might be very narrow, uh, narrow you know, in terms of the um, majority in either party. I think that there's going to be an expectation, and it's not an unreasonable one, that in exchange for a progressive formula that helps property poor towns more than we've done, more than we've done in my adult lifetime, we also are going to have to have conversations about how do we deliver, how do we keep a higher percentage of that education dollar inside the classroom? When I said earlier that we have the second highest administrative cost per pupil on average in the country, they call that administrative or indirect cost. And those dollars don't generally help educate a kid. We need to keep education dollars as much as possible inside the building, inside the classroom, because we know that's how we deliver outcomes at the best price. And, uh, and so uh, strategies that uh, lower administrative costs on a per pupil basis, at the same time that I'm increasing state support per pupil for education, not only do I think it's good policy, I also think it may be the way politically that I have to get there in order to get bipartisan support. You know, Ten years ago, we were much more consolidated than we are today. Our neighbors, Vermont, Maine, are going that way. Our pendulum is going the opposite, the opposite way. way. It is. And, um, and so is our administrative cost per pupil. To me, it's funny, when I talk about reducing administrative cost and best practices, I sound like what for the last 40 years we thought a Republican sounded like. But that is not, right now the definition of fiscal responsibility is detethered from math. We're not, I mean the mission, again the mission is how do we deliver the outcomes that matter most at the best price possible in a sustainable way. If, and I don't care what your, health care, transportation, education, addiction, mental health, if that's the way you look at the world as you attack every challenge, you've got the best chance of achieving uh, you know, optimal outcomes at a price that you're going to feel good about. Are you going to like paying taxes? Nobody likes paying any. I don't like paying any taxes. But what I want you to feel after a period of time is that the things that are, matter most to your community are being addressed in, a, in the most cost-effective way possible sustainably. I think if you can get people to that point, and you do it in a transparent way so you can, you can see the work and you can agree or disagree, um, you're going you're gonna to generally be pretty satisfied with what I and other people in public uh, life can deliver. But that has to be the way we think of it. Yes? Mike, I just wanted to comment about her, the uh, councilwoman's um, statement about rail service. It's great to have right in this town. But if it's going to become part of who we are as far as using it to commute, it's antiquated and it's out of date. It's uh, antiquated and it's slow. Slower than molasses running uphill. If you take a train from here to New York City, you're looking at a seven and a half hour train ride. If you take a bus from Lebanon to New York, it's four hours. Four and a half hours, nonstop. But the, the train is not user-friendly for people who are commuting. Well, and I think when the conversation about rail occurs with the uh, southern tier, Manchester, Nashua, um, that, that one difference there, I think the anticipation is that it would be uh, modern speed. And the other, to be honest, is most folks are thinking of it in terms of a commute into the 128 belt 
So it's a much shorter, it's a daily commute kind of thing. I don't, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'd be very interested. I don't anticipate that upgraded and, uh, and or expanded rail involving Claremont, uh, I mean, would, would you have much in the way of commute? Like what would be the... There, there was talk that really about high speed rail into Montreal. Um, it's far into the future, clearly, but it, there was talk about it, and that's why it was important for us. What, in a high-speed rail context, ballpark, how long would that ride be? Any idea? Well, from here to the car, it's about three and a half hours. Yes, yeah, three and a half by car. Right, right. Two, an hour and a half, probably. Be an hour and a half. Hmm. I commuted to Waterbury one summer as a law clerk for the okay. Agency of Natural Resources, but it was a once-a-week commute. An hour. And there's only one train each day <laughs> in each direction. Oh, okay, so you have to time that. You yeah. Don't miss that. Yeah. All right. Okay. The technology is going to get better. Well, and it sounds like it would have to. I, I mean, in order were, to be. There's a lot of. There's a lot of different standards we'd have to hit to be able to yeah. be considered for that. Um, hence, why it would be important for our city if we could. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think. So. Um, so my next question is, the state no longer does revenue sharing, uh, creating a loss of revenue at the local level. Do you believe revenue sharing should be reinstated? Why or why not? I go back to, and it's, uh, it, there's a theme today. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, it is, um, I get in a two year, it took us more than two years to get into this situation. It's gonna take me more than two years to get out of it. Uh, but let us begin. And uh, culturally, Revenue sharing is part of the cultural change that I'm talking about here in thinking about the way that we raise and spend money, looking for a scale where possible, something related to it that hasn't come up tonight, but that I think is an option that we should put on the table. So th this is a, there's a Portsmouth-centric element to it that has enlightened me as to how you should think about it statewide. So take the rooms and meals tax. So right now, Portsmouth generates a quarter of the state's rooms and meals tax, the city of Portsmouth. We have more restaurant seats than we have residents. <laughs> we have 20, 22,000 people and 24,000 restaurant seats. Wow. And a ton of hotels, and they keep going up. So we generate a quarter of all the rooms and meals tax for the entire state in a city of 22,000 people. Now, it gets, most of it stays up in the state. There's a percentage of it that comes back to local communities, and it is delivered back to local communities by population. So we put in 25%, but we get back about 2% because we're only 22,000 year round. We're 100,000 on the weekend, but 80,000 of them go home on Sunday. So it's calculated on the 22,000. Now, there are people in Portsmouth that say, if you put a quarter in, you should get a quarter out. Even I, as an ex-mayor and current resident of Portsmouth, understand that's both unworkable and that runs counter to what the best practices of governance would be, that would be another uh, step down the road of 234 communities that happen to be in one state. Uh, nobody else would do it like that. Now, do I think that you should have a local option, for example, that if you would like to increase the rooms and meals tax in your community by a fraction of a point for local revenue raised, like, again, many states in the country do, many cities do, I think that you should have the right to do that if your community decides that you think it's a good move. Now, if you do it, and then it turns out to backfire because you do it at a certain point where it's actually pushing out people and they go to a neighboring community that doesn't do that, well, and my advice if I was in your a mayor is I would probably stop. <laughs> but, but right now, you don't even have the option to have that conversation because we're not a home rule state. I, I would like New Hampshire to have a home rule uh, state element. Uh, because I do think that there are experiments done at the local and regional level, uh, kind of the, the state version of federalism, that can teach us a lot and that can become best practices within the state. But right now, unless state give, government gives you the right to do something, you cannot do it legally. And so I think that there are options uh, that could be attractive. Uh, so, but uh, in the big picture, um, the way we think about the distribution of revenue in the big picture uh, is something I think about regularly. Uh, because if I want the city of Claremont to see what I, what I, a, 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 a dramatic growth in entrepreneurship, which is a big part of what I want for Claremont in the long run, uh, then public investment that I know will draw the private investment needs to occur. And I know that you likely do not have the bonding capacity to do that unilaterally. 
So we should do what the rest of the country does. And if you're serious about it, you help make public investment in places where you want private investment. A little change of yeah. direction here. Uh, so recently uh, in the city, uh, there's been some conversation uh, about energy. Um, specifically about Governor Sununu's veto of uh, State Bill uh, 365 and, I mean, sorry, SB, Senate Bill 365 and SB 446. Um, some of the conversation that was had in, in this city was uh, about the potential costs to our city because of things like uh, our sewer treatment plant uh, composts, the uh, sludge using coal ash uh, that comes from a biomass facility. Um, the projection would be that that cost would go up considerably if this uh, veto wasn't lifted. Um, so I guess my question is, how do you feel about these two bills and about um, essentially uh, energy purchasers uh, paying a somewhat higher rate uh, to wood-burning uh, electricity facilities to just keep them afloat. Yeah. So I would have signed both of those bills. Or, or another way to put it is I would vote to overturn them, right? Because that's what's going to happen next month. Now, they're not perfect. Did you say that's what's going to happen next month? Uh, oh, the, uh, um, they're going to vote on it next month. September and uh, people that follow the, the headcount more closely than I do say it's a coin flip. It's going to be really close because they got to do it at a supermajority. They know they have a majority, but they don't know if they have the two-thirds necessary. It'll be very close. That's what I'm told. And it, I think that's right. Now, I would, uh, I would support both bills. I would have signed them. Uh, they're not perfect. So there are two elements dealing with the bills. One is uh, I put out a very comprehensive energy plan about a month ago uh, that gets at going bigger than sort of the tactical level that we've been talking about energy in this political season. You know, should the net metering cap be one megawatt or five megawatts? Should we sign these two particular bills or should we veto these two particular bills? Those are tactical, but they don't get at what's the mission here. And so to me, the mission is, how do I move towards renewable and conservation? How do we do it in a way that's positive for ratepayers? Uh, how do we diversify our energy sources so that we are not subjecting ratepayers to a potential price shock if you over rely on any one source, clean, dirty, whatever, for your energy? Uh, and how do we do it in a local way to maximize the entrepreneurial benefit of sources that uh, come from New Hampshire whenever possible? So I talked to a lot of smart people for a long time, and basically there are three big things we got to do. Number one, the renewable portfolio standard, which basically says right now that 25% of our electricity must come from renewable sources by the year 2025. I am saying that we should bump that up to communicate to the private sector they should invest heavily in New Hampshire on renewables and conservation technology by making it 50% by 2030. That is in line with what Maine, Vermont, and Massachusetts are poised to do by the early 2030s. It would dramatically increase demand for solar, for offshore wind, for biomass, small-scale hydro, uh, storage technology, which would be included in the RPS standard in my plan. I'll tell you something that I would not like to see included as a renewable is um, uh, trash incineration. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not a renewable. It's not a renewable. It is not. Now, I understand it's in one of the bills, and, and I just said I would support the, the, I would have signed those bills. And I said they're not perfect because I do support the biomass element. I don't like the continuation of incineration as, a, as part of the definition of renewable. So there's something I'd like to remove from the definition of renewable in the RPS standard change I want to make is incineration. Now there's something I want to add to it that's not currently in it, storage. Uh, the next frontier in renewable energy is when we figure out how to do storage, like for solar and wind, for example. We don't have it quite yet. And that is probably the single biggest cap right now in an outright explosion in renewables just going to the whole nother level. Uh, a handful of states have included renewable energy storage as part of how you reach your renewable portfolio standard. And that communicates to investors looking to get into renewable storage. This is an awesome place to go and do it 
because every, if you can do it, it'll count towards our 50% by 2030 goal. That's a very attractive uh, incentive. But I would seek to take the trash incineration out. By the way, in Pennsylvania and Ohio, coal is considered a renewable because it's Pennsylvania and Ohio. But so every state has different types that they count as renewable that I think a lot of you would not consider renewable. And for me, I think New Hampshire, the one element that we count that I, I think you got to go really is uh, trash incineration. We don't actually count trash incineration as a renewable in New Hampshire. We've worked hard to see that that never happened. Are you sure it's not right now? I'm sure it is. It's not right now. Not yet. That's the problem with 365 is that they tuck waste incineration in with biomass, which is renewable under our renewable portfolios. Yeah. So, okay, then I'm going to seek clarification. So right now, waste incineration as a standalone is not considered a renewable right. for the purpose of it. Not in New Hampshire. Not in New Hampshire, right. But you're Florida, saying that it's folded. In 365, yeah. they added the waste incineration piece in with the biomass, which is a renewable, so they get the benefits of being a renewable without actually being in the portfolio. So they're defining waste incineration as, as an indigenous renewable fuel, which makes them eligible under the bill by the specific. So they call it a biomass. Eight point one million dollars in, in price supports. So you're saying that the bill defines waste incineration as, in effect, biomass. Mm -hmm. no, it treats, no, it treats it separately in the language. You have you have biomass, which is a class and right. defined in the bill, and you have um, waste as an indigenous renewable fuel. And we're concerned. That if you begin to treat waste as a, a renewable fuel, that they are moving towards the renewable portfolio standard, and also with a closed incinerator in town, that there's the potential that investors will see that as a more attractive, uh, you know, plant to reopen. Okay, I appreciate that. The uh, it's interesting when I was in the process of developing the energy plan I put out a few weeks ago. Um, for the this may be a distinction without a difference, uh, so I'm not disputing what you're saying at all. But in talking to folks who I know share the view that you just expressed about the uh, lack of desirability of waste incineration being counted as a renewable, they, and maybe they were doing it because as a practical matter, it was being treated like it, or they, maybe they're saying it's on the road to, they were uh, describing it. We, we looked at national, uh, how every state defines renewables. Yes. And they, for the purpose for New Hampshire, they had included waste incineration as one, though I stand corrected that it is not in the standard right now. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do some more reading up and asking, but my position is uh, my position is very clear on this. Not only I do not want waste incineration to be considered a renewable, and uh, and I'm gonna do some more homework on this one. Uh, as it relates to uh, making sure that we're running away from that rather than anything that moves it in that direction. There's only one incinerator operating in the state generating electricity in Concord, fairly large one. Yeah. Um, and they are, at the current time, benefiting from a FERPA uh, power purchase agreement, which is part of the federal law. And under federal law, waste incineration is treated as a renewable. Yeah. And they get far above market rates yeah. selling their power. But that expires in April of 2019, I believe. Which is why this bill is here, to plug a revenue hole. I see. I see. This is helpful. All right, let me get some more homework. It's and, a subsidy. And there are several of us who are really trying to work towards um, uh, ending the permit for the Pennacook wheelabrator plant, yeah. too, because of that. Well, before we leave, I may, given your knowledge, I may ask, make sure I get your, con I, well, I, I, we know, but uh, co your contact info, because I may want to follow up on this a little bit. Uh, it's interesting that in the forums and debates that we've had, the limited number that Molly and I have had, Molly's generally sought to avoid them, but to the extent that we've had them, uh, energy has been a dominant issue in them. Uh, I mentioned the renewable portfolio standard. A second element that's in the plan is the uh, removal of the net metering cap. We're talking a lot about one versus five, but if you look at the states that have seen the greatest growth in renewables, right. including solar, uh, when I ask folks in those states, how'd you get there? The elimination of the net metering cap appears to be a key factor. We're at half of 1% solar, Vermont's at 10%, Mass is at 8% and growing. So it's not like it's Arizona and it's a different, sun. I mean, it's not like that. I mean, Vermont doesn't have more sun than us and they're able to do it, it's a public policy issue. And the third and final element, at least for the purpose of tonight, 
is um, energy efficiency programs. Mm -hmm. We've got some great programs, but an, a, a proposal without funding is called an idea. And so we have some funding, we have some energy efficiency programs that are not well funded. The REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, is supposed to be money that is collected when people exceed certain targets. It goes into an energy efficiency fund, 100% of it. Now you uh, accelerate uh, programs that reduce energy consumption. I mean, the virtuous circle gets going. But if you collect the money, and then 80% of it ends up going directly back to ratepayers, and only 20% of it stays in the REGI fund, the virtuous circle never gets a chance to get going. And so not only would I get that back to 100%, when you do the 50% by 2030 uh, RPS standard, there'll be, at least in the near term, additional alternative payments when you don't meet it that I would also put into the energy efficiency program. One last thing about it that I think is very important, uh, and I haven't heard other politicians talk about it. I think that the match on the energy efficiency programs, bless you, should be uh, a progressive match. Right now, roughly, you get an energy audit, okay, and then they say, hey, I got $10,000 worth of uh, energy efficiency here. Uh, if there's money in the program, which there typically is not right now, but if there is, roughly 5,000 of it would be uh, a grant, and you'd have to come up with the other 5,000. The problem is that two-thirds of Americans can't pay a $1,000 emergency medical bill. So how the hell are they going to pay for a $5,000 energy efficiency program? So they don't. So the people that end up taking advantage of the program tend to be the people at the higher end of the income level because they're the ones with the liquidity to throw down five grand. Their homes also tend to be the most energy efficient already. Yes. It's, it's not a good policy. So instead, you make it a progressive match that as your income level goes down, the match is not 50%. It's higher than that to the point where it's almost 100%. Mm -hmm. That has the effect of getting people in the game that are on the bottom half of the income scale. It has the effect of increasing your energy efficiency per dollar because the homes on the bottom half tend to have more opportunity. And the third is it puts operating money, energy savings, back in the pocket of the population in our community, most likely to turn around the extra 20 bucks or 40 bucks a month and put it right back into the local economy. People at the high end of the scale tend to make long-term saving or investment with it, and that's nice. But if you're serious about injecting into the local economy for immediate stimulus, lower half of the income stream, getting more operating money in their pocket, equals more stimulus for the local economy. So it's, um, it's a priority, it's good energy policy, and it's good economics. And nobody else running for governor in either party is thinking remotely in this kind of approach. They're all like, you know, uh, I want a net meter and cap of five megawatts, and that's their energy plan. That may be one of them calling right now asking for advice. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, home to a thriving manufacturing and business center sector, we are home to two of the top five fastest growing companies in the state. One of the biggest challenges for th for those employers is a trained workforce. And what do you what would you do to make New Hampshire a better draw for workers? And in this case, I think we'll put it in the context of older workers. Well, I mean, I got two problems I got to address at the same time dealing with Thank workforce. You. One is. Um, those that are already here, either upgrading skills or retaining younger people who often leave before I have a chance to get my talents into them to keep them in the workforce. Um, but I got a second problem. That population is shrinking. Uh, it's demographics, lowest birth rate in the country. And so if you're doing a better and better job of retaining the population you have here at a given moment, you're fighting a losing war because the pool keeps shrinking. So even if you get a higher percentage engaged, you have to do that every year just to stay even because the, percent, the pie itself is getting smaller every year. So I need to increase the size of the pie. One of the things I really like about the, the plan for the debt-free college, which by the way would apply for the two-year, it applies for building trades, it's the same concept, just at different price points. Look, for 40 years, my entire lifetime, we have communicated unwittingly the following. If you go to a four-year on-campus college, you're a success, and if you don't, you're not. But of course, that's silly. That, that, that you could be, that you, you, you could be successful if you do that. I also think that if you want to know if your uh, electrician, carpenter, or sheetrocker is a success, after you're done here, I'd like you to call an electrician, find out how soon they can get there, it could be a while, and then find out how much they're going to charge you an hour, it'll be more than you wish. 
Tell me who's successful now. My dad, with an eighth grade education, got us into the middle class as an immigrant family by being able to do carpentry, electrical. I did sheetrock with my dad. It's hard work. You can't, off, you can't outsource it. In a growing economy, the building trades are an essential part. There are, there are local economies in New Hampshire that are impeded in economic growth because they don't have the building trades folks around to be able to do the construction work that is part of an expanding economy. So I, when I talk about this, it's not just four year, it's two year, it's continuing education, it's building trades and so forth. But I, what I want, say in Claremont, is I want relationships where businesses here seeking talent are building relationships. I love it if they build it with kids at the local schools here. But I also don't mind if they're competing to draw kids from other parts of the state or other parts of the country for that matter to say, listen, I, you come to New Hampshire for college or post-secondary education. We got a program. They'll pay for half. I'll pay for the other half. You go work for me in between your years of education. And at the end of it, you come and work for me for three or more years. You got no college debt. You have no post-secondary debt. So that is a powerful carrot that I want to be able to give to businesses here. And it doesn't have to be Stevens. Seriously. Like, I mean, I want my Portsmouth kids to stay in Portsmouth, you know? But if a Claremont-based business is able to make a compelling pitch to a kid in Portsmouth, I, I'm a free market guy. Rock and roll. And you've got some great businesses here that, with that tool, I think could compete very favorably. You got, I'll tell you, you've got much lower cost of living here than in Portsmouth. Our housing crisis over there is a different kind of housing crisis. Um, we got no room to build anything. We're 15 square miles. And, and folks I don't agree with in town are so infatuated with 40 feet building height limits, right? There are three dimensions to building, to dealing with your affordable housing crisis. This, this, and this. And in so many places, people equate height with ugliness or, I don't know, modernity in a, in a negative way. Uh, but um, some of the most beautiful buildings in New Hampshire are actually quite tall. They just have to fit as part of a, 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 the thought of place. And you've got a great downtown here. Uh, I think it's very attractive for a, a younger population that's looking for kind of a walkability and a, and a small city urban feel. But you need some help with the uh, public sector investment because you lack the tax base to be able to do it yourself. So what investments do you think the state should make in Sullivan County specifically to increase prosperity? Well, I mean, Claremont is, is uh, I know you mentioned the county. Uh, Claremont is the hub of it. I mean, it's the urban hub. It is the opportunity. I mean, the rail element in the long term could be part of that. So compared to, say, the natural man, there's more work to do probably you know, there. Um, I mean, honestly, uh, it all comes back to helping communities in Sullivan County, like other counties, uh, pay for quality education. Because until we do that right, everything else is chasing your tail. So uh, you may be aware that in much of the state, you know, a lot of folks in New Hampshire have not spent a lot of time in Claremont. And uh, if they have lived here long enough, when they hear Claremont, the first thing they think of is the lawsuit, <laughs> the education lawsuit. I mean, in, in Concord, people call, they, they, you know, uh, they talk about Claremont. Like, they, the tone they say it is a public policy. They'll be like, so, you want to talk about education? Yeah, let's talk about Claremont. And then you know exactly what they mean by that. And what's interesting to me is that as we are on the cusp of what I believe will be the 2010s and 2020 round of the similar conversation, it'll be interesting to see how people equate, you know, their, their 90s history with what will be their 2020s history. There's going to be a lot of similarities there. It'll be interesting because Claremont will be part of that again, at least as an example of where the state's got to, you know, stop dropping the ball. Uh, so I'm fascinated by how that's going to play out. But it's, it's increasing ed funding. And I think for a place like Claremont in particular, uh, doing what other states do in helping uh, uh, provide opportunity for the kind of public sector investment that will attract private sector investment. That's part of our job. One thing I'd like to do after the biennial budget process is done in June of my first year, you got 18 more months as governor. And a lot of governors, you know, they go cut ribbons and they take pictures at Lost River or the top of Mount Washington. And, and that's fine. 
Uh, but I would like to take my auditor's background and actually get in a van or something and go to different towns every couple of days around the state and do things not unlike tonight a little bit, but instead of me maybe answering a lot of questions as governor, I'll answer them, but I'd like to ask a lot more questions uh, to identify, you know, where are you uh, on a 10-year plan in terms of capital investment? Where are you educationally relative to where you'd like to be? Put my auditor's hat back on and use the bully pulpit you know, if a governor clears his or her throat, you got more likely somebody's going to listen. Uh, so use that bully pulpit in a way to direct attention to local and regional needs and opportunities. And that's where I think the unique background I've got. You know, I'd like to spend a day in Claremont sometime in the summer of 2019, get the right people around the table, and ask lots of big questions and see where the opportunities are and learn from patterns when I talk to other communities around the state like that. If you want young people to stay in this area or anywhere in New Hampshire. I have three kids that do not live here in New Hampshire. They're, number one, there's nothing for them to do. Secondly, there is no affordable housing for them. In a, in a decent complex, in a decent community, um, there is no housing. The number one reason why communities have the housing problems they do uh, is because of the tremendous reliance on property taxes that we have. Again, I keep going back. It's a systems approach to governance. Almost everything that you care about is impacted in some way by two big things. The way the politicians raise the money that they use to run their campaigns, and the way that we raise the money to pay for government. Until you get your arms around those in a really thoughtful way, it is difficult. You're treating symptoms rather than causes for the most part. So when you rely on property taxes more than about any state in America, a couple of things happen. So for example, we, whether we know it or not, we end up incentivizing communities to zone out children because kids cost money. I think you mentioned at the outset, 50 to 70% of virtually every local government's budget is schools. Now the good news is that's the thing to spend the money on. The bad news is more of it's going to administrative than ever. And the other bad news is um, that because of that, communities go, man, if I got a shrinking tax base, then I, got I can't afford to be paying for a lot of kids. And that's why you see an explosion in like 50 plus or 55 plus housing. It's why you see a discouragement of apartments, affordable housing projects, density, height, all of these concepts of land use. Um, uh, uh, end up pushing you away from kids. It's why in a place like Windham, you see the sprawl that you do. They put minimum acreage zoning to try to put a cap on the number of kids that could move to Windham in the next 10 or 15 years. And they can afford to do it more than most communities. But that's, that's been the, uh, the, those are the ramifications of, of relying more on property taxes than any state in America. So moving away from that in the long run, one of the effects of that will be It'll have positive changes in housing. A lot, of that, a lot of the projects that would get you more affordable or workforce housing, for example, there's some things you can do at the state level. A lot of that deals with your local zoning and land use. The most powerful person in town, with all due respect to those here and not here, I know this as a former mayor, it's not the school board chair or the mayor. It's the chair of your land use boards. That's some power right there. They are, they are driving the train on development. So uh, one of the things that, when I get in the van next July, right, and, I'm, and I visit Claremont sometime after the holiday weekend there, uh, is um, uh, talk about land use a little bit. Where are you guys looking at land use? What's your vision on land use? How does it fit into where you want to be as a community 10, 20 years from now? That's not a sexy conversation, but that's driving a train. I'd say it was potentially a potentially powerful position, not necessarily. It depends how that's being managed. Uh, that's a good point. It has, that's right. It, ha it has uh, power sits in the position. It just, and, and when you have, by the way, when you have really uh, sophisticated, thoughtful systems approach type people in positions of land use uh, in your community, you feel the difference. It's, it's a very positive thing. So we have one more question. Okay. Yes. Pass the mic around the top. Um, so our city council recently um, unanimously approved joining a lawsuit along with many other cities and counties across the state against pharmaceutical companies um, in reference 
to the opioid crisis. What is your position and goals in reference to that? Well, first, I generally agree with the uh, idea of litigation to deal with it. I think if you look, the there's all kinds of reasons. First of all, we take it for granted. But like the advertising of pharmaceuticals on television, that, do, that doesn't happen in the world. There's a handful of countries in the world that, that allow that. It's bizarre. But because we're used to it, we think it's not bizarre. You know? So that's, I mean, that's, a, that's a tactical level thing. But uh, I spent enough time with people working in recovery, people themselves in long-term recovery. Uh, some folks, Governor Sununu says this. He says, geez. Why would you support the legalization of cannabis when we are suffering from an opiate crisis? Apples and oranges. It is totally apples and oranges. In fact, I argue strongly that legalization of cannabis is a positive factor in reducing addiction. Because the, the gateway for addiction, it's not cannabis, it's prescription opiates. That's the gateway drug. And the way it happens is it's because of a healthcare system. I mean, again, it's just, it, they're all related. It's a healthcare system where the doctor's got to get you in and out in 8, 10, 12 minutes because they got to keep moving because that's, that's how they're getting paid. And so they don't have time to cure you. What they do is, remember, uh, prescription opiates are uh, by nature palliative in nature. They do not cure you. They are there to relieve pain. They're not curative. And it means that they're there, let me try to relieve the pain. We're going to, hopefully it will go away. If it doesn't, come on back in a few weeks. I'll give you some extra op uh, doses so to make sure, in case you need a few extra days, you put it in the, uh, you put it in the, um, uh, in the, uh, the cabinet, in the, uh, in the bathroom, and then you end up getting addicted to it and using it beyond what you should. Other people in the home, including kids and teenagers, end up accessing them. Um, they are far more addictive than they were advertised not that long ago. And until recently, the state did a pretty lousy job of monitoring the prescription of said drugs. Uh, less than, I think it was three years ago, in 2015, there was a three-month sample of the database that the state is supposed to use when you prescribe an opiate. Uh, and you're supposed to check it before you make another prescription. Well, here's what they found. In one three-month period in the state of New Hampshire, uh, 110,000 people had been prescribed an opiate at least one time in those three months alone in New Hampshire. That's almost 10% of the state. And the number of prescriptions was 990,000. That's, think about that. Almost one-tenth of the state was in there at least once and had been prescribed an average of nine prescriptions in one three-month period in New Hampshire. That's not supposed to happen. And now it's better. And by the way, it's an area of bipartisan opportunity. This is a place where Republicans and Democrats have generally been coming together because you know, sometimes it takes a crisis, and we, we have one. Uh, so uh, you need to continue to upgrade and put accountability into the monitoring process. You need to do things like lower the prescription dose that is uh, permitted, because otherwise you get this excess that has helped accelerate some of the problems. And you got to hold the drug companies accountable. I think they knew a lot more about the potency of these opiates than they were letting on for a long time. And it has, it has led to suffering and death. By the way, economic hardship, it has affected our workforce. Um, you know, you've got to hold people accountable. It was initially uh, marketed as a, uh, a drug to reduce the amount of addiction that occurred because uh, the scheduling of taking it was much easier than the previous drugs that they were prescribing. I listened to a, a long... Um, discussion by an NPR one day. <laughs> but uh, the, the pharmaceutical reps that were bringing these things into the, the doctor's offices, were that was what they were selling it as. Uh, and many of them knew very early on that that was not indeed the case. Questions well, on the floor? They'll be held accountable. Could you talk a little bit about your um, perception of climate destabilization and what are some ideas you have about dealing with that? Well, it shouldn't be controversial, but climate change is real. So that's what we call a true fact. Uh, and it's not hypothetical. We're paying for it now. 
Uh, even when I was mayor of Portsmouth more than a decade ago, uh, we had to make significant changes in our zoning laws and our, our building codes because of the anticipation and the early evidence of rising waters. Mm -hmm. uh, there's real cost to that. Uh, we have construction that's been done in long-standing homes in parts of Portsmouth where uh, flooding is now a regular occurrence. That it, at the time it wasn't an issue, and now it is too. When we look at the, hundred, the next 100 years on the seacoast, you know, uh, I can't afford um, waterfront property, but I'm going to get it. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, then, and I don't want it. I don't want it. So it's real, and it's happening now. And that's also, that's also everything from our maple industry, our tourism industry. You know, Chris Sununu, who's an environmental engineer, and I hope one thing that comes across tonight, I've not spent a lot of time trashing Donald Trump or Chris Sununu. I hope you leave tonight going, I don't know if I agree with everything the guy's got, but he definitely spent time on it, and he's trying to fix stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this just to go beat somebody. I'm doing this to try to make positive differences where I think we can. But I am going to take a, a moment to compare myself with Chris uh, Sununu. Chris is an environmental engineer, which means he should be more sophisticated than the average bear on this topic. But he is not. At times in the recent past, he has suggested that the, the, uh, the data are not clear as it relates to climate science. I think we, I think we got this one. Uh, he also, I would argue, has largely supported policies that move us away from where the science tells us we should go in dealing with climate change. And uh, he has been silent. This is an important point. There's two ways that you fail the test in the age of Trump. One is if you agree with him on certain areas that I think are just downright detrimental to our economy, our culture, our future. The other way is the complicity of silence. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Charlie Baker didn't vote for Donald Trump. Phil Scott didn't vote for Donald Trump. Chris Sununu campaigned with Donald Trump. He has been to the White House more than any governor in America since, he, since the beginning of 2017. And so many times he has been quiet. Well, we're the only state in, in the East that has not uh, petitioned for the federal government to do an offshore wind study of any state that has a coast. We're the only one. Paul LePage has given it the OK. We're to the right of Paul LePage. <laughs> and, and I want to be clear, us French Canadian uh, chief executives, uh, we are much more like Trudeau than we are like LePage. All right? Um, I mean, but, and, and, and he would have the unique opportunity as a Republican governor with an environmental engineering background to lead on this issue. It, it would be good for him politically, and it would be good policy. But he's just silent. While what we get out of the, the, uh, the uh, Paris Climate Accord, Meanwhile, there are a large number of states and cities around the country that have joined, and I, the day it happened, I suggested that we should join it, you know, I would do it as governor, uh, to join the climate accord. It's, it's, it's ridiculous that we're doing these workarounds on public policy because uh, we don't want to be part of international agreements because right now Donald Trump thinks that being part of an international coalition is somehow inherently a bad thing. I think NATO has been a good thing for the last 70 plus years for the world. And I think the climate treaty is a good thing. And it was a hard fought thing to get and benefits the United States as much as it does any country in the agreement in the world. So uh, his complicity of silence on this is, uh, bothers me as much as it does on any issue. Uh, and my energy plan um, is meant to try to lead quite aggressively where we can as a state on uh, doing our part to where the future of the energy economy needs to go which is you know, the, the cleanest and cheapest unit of energy is the one you don't use. So we need to aggressively focus on conservation, on storage for renewables, and on renewables themselves with that focus on the energy efficiency plan. If I was running for federal office, there are things that I could address that are harder to do as a small state on climate change. But um, I spend a lot of time uh, with, um, with folks at UNH who have been leading on trying to create a generational climate change plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, they advise me. Uh, one other thing, by the way, I've been, I was disappointed with Governor Sununu's uh, agriculture commissioner selection. Um, if you look at New Hampshire's agricultural economy, there is a niche where we actually have a real opportunity to explode, and it's organic. Uh, and 
and technology related to sustainable farming practices. We have never had an ag commissioner who specifically had a background in organic farming. But there's this niche that we really had. We, we were a national leader, and UNH was a national leader. Uh, Gary Hirschberg and uh, Stonyfield was funding heavily research in it. We were seen nationally as a leader. I was working there while we were doing that. And, and I thought that um, uh, when Lorraine Merrill uh, stepped down, there was an opportunity for the new commissioner uh, to be somebody who maybe could jump into that and really go. And instead, we chose Sean Jasper, basically, to get him out of the House of Representatives. That's why they did it. And they said, well, he's got a farming background. Well, kind of, poultry. And his, it was a few, several generations in the past. And then when his generation of the family uh, got the farm, they sold it for commercial development. Mm -hmm. According like, to the Department of Ag in New Hampshire, the fastest growing segment of agriculture in New Hampshire is organic, small scale, and women. That, that's, that's that jives with everything I'm aware of. And um, data. It's, it's just very frustrating because when you're a small state, I mean, first of all, we're losing in terms of uh, top grade farming land. Uh, it's, it, it, we've been losing that as a percentage of the state. Uh, and what we zoned it industrial here in Claremont, some yeah. of our best ag land. And, and again, uh, Commissioner Jasper, I'm not, I mean, he's a nice guy, but his experience in farming was exactly that. It was generations of poultry farming, and then when his generation gained control of the farm, they sold it for development. It's not farmland anymore. This is the opposite of the message you'd want to send. So that was very frustrating. Um, you know, when you get to be governor, you don't get to pick all your own commissioners. Uh, unless they resign, they get to fill a four-year term, typically. So, so uh, uh, Governor Sununu has had a disproportionate number of appointments in a short amount of time as a governor. So I'm going to have to deal with that. <laughs> um, I have two quick questions. Would you accept federal funding to arm teachers? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, just wondering because that was just yeah. lost out there. The second question is about your universal health care plan. Mm. Um, you would have to do this on the national level, right? Because Vermont looked at it and they, they couldn't sustain it on their own. So you would support uh, a national program for it, right? Or do you have something that you think can work for New Hampshire? Uh, this absolutely is best done at the national level. I'm not optimistic in the next few years we're going to move the ball too much with the uh, current composition. So there are things you can do at the state level. Uh, for example, uh, Nevada is looking at a Medicaid for all program, which would be the equivalent of a public option. Remember when the Affordable Care Act was getting hashed out in 09? They talked about a public option. Didn't end up happening. Would have been a pretty big deal in public policy. I think they needed to take it out to get the votes they needed. They barely had enough votes, uh, even with the Democratic majority, to pass what they did. Uh, but Nevada has looked at using Medicaid dollars for a Medicaid for all program that would allow anybody, including people starting a business and so forth, to purchase into a Medicaid type program. Uh, good news, it's largely state controlled, so you wouldn't need as many waivers as you would for other ideas. Bad news, if we're being honest, it's not as great a plan as say, a Medicare for all plan would be in terms of the quality of the plan itself. I, I love Medicare. I, I retired after working 49 years, and I've never been happier on Medicare. People think that it's like a free thing, but we still have to pay 100 plus dollars a month for the plan, um, and then uh, an additional 100 and something dollars a month for the supplemental. However, um, if everybody paid that, I, don't, I never use it. I, I, the only reason I go to the doctor once a year is because he won't renew my medicine if I don't see him. So, so if everybody did that and not that many people went, you could fund something like that. You know, and I do think that's where it's going. I mean, in fact, if you look at what conservative think tanks around the country, conservative think tanks around the country are doing, Manhattan Institute is one of them. They're basically saying this, look, some form of universal health insurance is going to happen, conservatives. So you can either be part of the conversation and help shape it in a way that has some kind of free market element into it, or you can sit in the sidelines with your arms crossed while it happens. And so uh, one quick example. So uh, the Manhattan Institute has proposed this, and there's some bipartisan interest in it. And you could do it not as a small state, but you could do it regionally. Like you could probably get some kind of a northeast co-op kind of plan. So Singapore's got a model, 
where everybody gets universal preventative care, and then there's universal catastrophic care, and then they have a health savings account to cover the middle. Well, the problem with an HSA is the S, the savings. If you don't have any money, the HSA is worthless. So what they do is mean t means test the HSA based on income, kind of like what I was talking about earlier with the energy efficiency model. As you go down, more of it's filled with public dollars. You get below a certain level, it's 100% covered with public dollars. In effect, for a poorer uh, residents, dollar one universal care. But it allows you with the HSA for non-emergency procedures to still have that element of uh, free market uh, forces working to theoretically drive down costs in certain places. So, I mean, I'm, I'm cool with Medicare for all, but I also know that uh, I have no idea what the composition of Congress, the Senate, or the presidency is going to look like in the next five years. I don't know, in the next five months. <laughs> uh, I mean, any, any, nothing right now could happen that would blow my mind on politics. I, this is like nothing I've ever seen. And, uh, and it means that we have to be prepared for a number of potential opportunities or obstacles as it relates to health care reform. Preston Herzog, you have a question for you? Yes. Um, so after Parkland, we saw a lot of students trying to get involved inside of the process with specific bills, such as Senator Hennessy's amendment uh, in the Senate. But um, it seemed that the legislature, and specifically Governor Sununu, seemed to block some of those access, access uh, of students trying to enter the uh, legislative process. What would you do as governor to ensure that students have uh, partake inside of the legislative process throughout bills that pertain to them. Press Preston is a student at Stevens High School, by the way. Right on. All right, thank you for being here today. Um, there aren't a lot of people, much less younger people, that would say, you know what I'm doing on a Saturday night? I'm a gubernatorial candidate for a few hours. So I think, that, I think that's amazing. All right, that's awesome. Um, well, first of all, and uh, I alluded to this earlier, on the participatory part of the process, uh, there are a couple of bills that got signed by Sununu. I mentioned SB 1264, uh, uh, HB 1264 and SB 3 make it harder to vote, particularly for young people. You got to repeal those and you put automatic voter registration in. Uh, shouldn't be any drama in registering to vote. Um, the, it, well, and then I would argue, you know, it's funny, on, on college campuses, for example, uh, not just the voting part, but uh, we have an interesting subset of young people that run for the legislature. But we make it harder and harder to do it. Uh, because, you know, 30 years ago, the legislature only met every other year. And then they changed it and they said, you can meet the second year. And then they started adding a lot of work. Now it's basically a full-time job for big chunks of the year, but you still get paid 100 bucks a year. And consequently, the demographics of the people in elected office uh, I mean, New Hampshire has the second highest median age, but that's only 44. The average legislator's age is north of 60 years old right now because you pretty much have to be retired in, in order to do the job in a serious way. There are a handful of other professions that if you're self-employed, you got a shot. That's pretty much it. And it means that it's not terribly representative even though you've got 400 legislators. You'd think it'd be incredibly representative, but it's not. And so you have a small number of young people who could be part of the process. My advice to young people who want to be involved in the civic, civic life, and I'm a little biased in this, I actually think local government is the best place to do it. A, you don't have to drive very far, city hall or a meeting or a school board meeting. Uh, second, uh, it's accessible. It is remarkable how few people have to be involved in a local decision-making process in order for the elected official to feel like the reign of public opinion has come down on them. If you get five or ten emails or letters from people that you don't usually get, there, there are ten emails you get all the time from the same ten people on every issue, it doesn't matter. You still care, but, you know. But when you start getting communication from people whose faces and names you don't usually see, I am telling you, your ears perk up big time, very quickly. And when you see a young person get involved, it is such an anomaly, unfortunately, right now, that it has even more outsized impact. And there are a lot of school boards and other uh, uh, functions of government where young people can either have, I don't know whether you do this in Claremont, uh, whether you have like a student uh, advisory element? I am. The All right, there you go. Very nice. Well, that's great. I, communities that don't have that, I always advise them to do so. Uh, you're going to be a better body for it if you do that. And um, 
I also like having uh, young people involved in other, like uh, uh, if you got an economic development commission, uh, even land use. I, I actually think for land use, even having you in an advisory role so that young people can learn the impact of land use, I don't see that a lot in local government, right? But I think that's an important opportunity. And I'm telling you, if, you, if you're doing what you're doing tonight, you're going to stand up pretty quick. Now what we want is we need uh, uh, five more of you here tonight. That's the next step. <laughs> got a question on the far side. Yeah, uh, well, appreciate you coming and sharing your vision with us here tonight. And uh, you, you've touched on some of uh, actually gone on at length about some of the most important issues that we face with the education funding and uh, with <clears throat> energy and, and with um, business, uh, drive, driving new business and keeping uh, kids in, in the state. And you're, you're very well reasoned as far as you, the plans that you would like to put in place to do that. But looking at the population of, of the uh, legislature in Concord now, how much of a percentage change do you think we need to swing towards people that were more uh, progressive yeah. in, in, in their outlook in order to be able to implement some of these things outright? Or, or would you, do you anticipate having to do a lot of uh, horse trading to get it through? Well, I, first I think your part, big part of your job as governor is to lead. So you start with what you aspire to get to, and then make the argument and try to win the argument. But I appreciate in a 424 member combined legislature, um, you're never gonna get everything. So I do spend time thinking about what are the elements in the various parts of public policy that I would have the greatest impact so that if I have to lean in on certain things, they're the ones that matter most. So one thing, for example, we haven't talked about uh, too much tonight. I mentioned it in my early remarks. On gun policy, right, I've got a seven point gun plan. And I think I, I pretty much listed them out mm -hmm. in the outset. But of the seven, they're not all created equal. The one of the seven that would probably make the greatest positive impact on lowering gun violence and gun deaths in New Hampshire would be the 48-hour wait period. So the funny thing is that I've taken it on the road so much. I've done town hall meetings just on guns uh, in a number of communities. I answer quite people bring their guns, as I mentioned. I mean, they're pretty diverse populations that show up. <laughs> And uh, the intersection of positive impact and policy and actually minimal political cost, you know, capital spent to make it happen, one of the best areas in all the stuff we've talked about tonight is the 48-hour wait period. Most gun owners say, I got no problem with that. Because they, especially when you link it to reduction in gun-related suicide. So you look for the areas in public policy that are ideally at the intersection of relatively low cost of political capital, because you only got so many hours in the, you know, and, and, but that have maximum impact. Independent <laughs> redistricting commission, that's a very high priority to me. Mm -hmm. the public funding of elections, that's a high priority to me. Getting pre-K funding to, to make that a reality, for, that's a high priority to me. I mean, I've got, there are dozens of policy proposals that reign over all these different areas. But they're not all going to get done in two years, you know? So you find the ones where there's the greatest impact. The other thing is, I think that there is going to be a strong year for Democrats this fall. There are about 70 seats held by Republicans right now that are in Democratic-leaning districts. And I think that if Democrats win at least 45 of those 70 vulnerable seats and then hold most of the others, which um, I feel pretty confident about, Democrats would be at around 225 in the House. And that's enough that you can you can move an agenda. I've also tried to be unusually specific and direct in what that agenda looks like. And there are dozens and dozens of non-incumbent uh, candidates for state rep. In fact, right before here, we had a meet and greet in Salem. The young woman who's running for the house in Salem, I think she's got a great chance at winning in a community that can be difficult. But she's got great roots, and she's working hard. And she has, uh, adopt she has embraced much of the agenda that I've put forth, and I try to do it with specificity on my website and in my remarks, so that if you're a candidate who wants to embrace it, I, make, I try to make it really easy to do so. And as the nominee, which obviously I hope to be in a few weeks, um, I'm not doing this so I can veto bad ideas, right? I'll do that. But I'm here to move forward, advocate for, urge to get on my desk and sign really good ideas. And I need a team to do that, and so I want to campaign vigorously with legislators that will be part of getting there. 
including in towns that are not automatic democratic towns. We, we've got about sure. 10 minutes left. I've just been oh, sure. notified by the TV sure. station. So I know, Rebecca, you've got a question. Yes. Oh, go, go right ahead. So um, I really appreciate you coming here tonight and sharing your ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that happened in our community about a year ago is a young biracial boy was hung by his neck. Uh, details are up in the air, whatever. So um, there are some of us who have begun a group called the Racial Healing Working Group, and we've been um, just studying different resources to look into racism, white supremacy. Um, uh, and so one of the things that has come to light that seems to be important is as a gubernatorial candidate, um, how much um, connection do you have to people of color uh, or minorities that are informing you on some of your policies? The, uh, well, uh, obviously, look, as a heterosexual white male, I appreciate that I do not obviously represent traditionally underrepresented groups. And yet, I have found that some of the connections that I've made uh, in public life, and as a candidate over the last year and a half, that have been the most powerful, uh, have been with people that, ha that are nothing like me, that I've met along the way, because we, we have at least some intersection of shared life experience that allows for the beginning of a conversation that enlightens me. I mean, I do, I, look, I teach. Like, you're going to leave tonight knowing more about me. Hopefully, you're going to tell your friends. Hopefully, it'll be nice. Um, but I typically learn more than I teach when I hit the road, which will make me a better governor. And so, for example, on the issue of immigration, uh, we put out our first TV ad a few days ago. Huh? And it's in French. Mm. It's in French with English subtitles. And it talks about immigration and the positive power of immigration. And I'll see. And, uh, and I needed to break through, you know, boring ad doesn't break through. Well, that one, that one got a lot of attention. It's in black and white. It's me looking into a camera, speaking French for about 30 seconds with English subtitles. And, I, and the name of the ad is The, uh, the Complicity of Silence. It goes back to Chris Sununu being quiet while Donald Trump talks in the worst ways about race and immigration and diversity in this country. You have a responsibility at a time in the age of Trump, you have a responsibility right now to communicate about the positive power of diversity, mm -hmm. including immigration and racial diversity and gender diversity and sexual orientation, and sexual identity. The folks that have been, in some ways, my, my strongest supporters have been non-white, both immigrant and non-white native-born, uh, residents of places like Manchester and Nashua. Because my life experience, though I look like I look, my parents are immigrants, English is not the first language of the house, and even into the early 1980s, as a French Canadian, with an obviously French Canadian last name at Gosler Park Elementary School in Ward 11 in Manchester, some of the, the rhetoric that was used to describe the French kids is complete, like, for example, that we used, they used to call kids like us pied noir. That's Blackfoot. And I was like, I don't know what that means. You know what it means? French Canadian French is seen as poor person French compared to Parisian French. So they call it Haitian French. P. Noir. It's a racist term. It's a racist term. You don't know that when you're a kid. And you don't realize that if that's what they're saying to me, what are they saying to the kids that aren't even white? You know what I mean? Like, it's, it was na it's edgy, it's nasty, it's, it's awful. Uh, so you're trying to communicate shared experiences. When I gave my immigration plan in late June, I did it in Manchester. And I did it in front of a statue in Lafayette Park, which is a block from where I was born. And it's a statue of a man by the name of Ferdinand Gagnon. Ferdinand Gagnon was a 19th century immigrant from Quebec. He was a journalist, a French language journalist, who in my community was seen as one of, if not the leader, in exposing systematic discrimination against the dominant immigrant group of that time, French Canadians. I am not in this country today if Ferdinand Gagnon does not do what he did, because my parents aren't in this country. And I feel like we right now, especially with the hate, dealing with race, immigrants, 
diversity, all that. We have an obligation, at least a little bit, to stand on the shoulders of the people that made it possible for many of us to be here, regardless of our race. If we don't speak up, it is not clear to me that anybody else is going to speak up right now. And one of the major tenets of why I'm running for governor is because I believe in this chaotic era, much like after Watergate, there's so much force getting pushed down on us that if successful, we'll move the goalpost on policy in the wrong direction, that we need to yank it back with equal uh, vigor and specificity and force. And I think that when I communicate in that way, particularly in uh, some of our urban centers, Manchester and Nashua, with both immigrants and non-white native populations, the amount of affection that we have connected with that far goes way beyond what I ever thought it would when I started the campaign, I, that excites me very much. I think, um, I think folks in that situation appreciate um, how much I value their contribution if we're going to be the state I want us to be for the next 20 years. Steve, thank you. All right. I'll be happy to be right here. Thank you, folks, for coming out tonight and spending the evening with us. Um, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. I'll be back in the general. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.